right, put away your lightsabers, turn off the transporters. We're talking real science, y'all. That's right, it's time for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest, or a couple, to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse and to play a game with us. We're not going to play a game tonight. Uh, we do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Aloha. Our guests this week are Catherine Massaro. Say hi. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm here. <laughs> Jack Clements. Hi. And Bruce Press. Hello, all. You know, that's interesting. I had this in the order that you all actually are appearing. It's fantastic. It's magic. That's it's what magic. we do. Yeah. It, you would think it was science. All right, so Catherine Asaro has written more than 25 books in science fiction, fantasy, and near-future thrillers. She earned her doctorate in chemical physics and master's in physics, both at Harvard. Uh, oh, both at Harvard. Wow, she's smart, y'all. Her works, <laughs> the Quantum Rose, and the Space Time Pool are both Nebula Award winners. Among her other distinctions, she is a multiple winner uh, of the... And Lab from Analog Magazine and RT Book Club Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. Her most recent books are Under City at Bane and Lightning Strike Book 2. Her latest books, The Bronze Skies, came out from Bane in 2016. A former ballet and jazz dancer, Catherine has performed on both coasts and in, and in Ohio. <laughs> she performed at various cons and jazz clubs. She has appeared at cons and other venues as a guest of honor or another guest in the uh, U.S. and abroad. Uh, she is way too talented for this show, but we tricked her. Uh, Jack <laughs> is, is, is a former Lockheed Martin engineer, another smart guy, executive, and degreed rocket scientist. Uh, he was an engineer and team leader on NASA's Apollo and Space Shuttle programs. He has given talks across the Mid-Atlantic region on the Apollo Moon program, on the design and first flights of NASA Space Shuttle, and on the subject of why science matters. He also came on this show and did all that, too. He also appeared in the command module segment of Moon Machines, the Discovery Science Channel's award-winning six-part documentary about the Apollo program. He's a published science fiction author and a member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and he writes a bi-weekly space and science blog for Amazing Stories Online magazine. And then there's Bruce. You know. Bruce? Right, yeah. <laughs> and you're all asking, well, what is he doing? Right. <laughs> uh, Bruce has spent 30 years as a computer engineer and regrets none of it except for all the time he didn't spend as a photographer. He is a husband to one and a father to many, or so it seems. When he is not uh, creating images or video, he is working to promote science, critical thinking, podcasts, and the idea that everyone on this planet will be equally screwed if we don't pull it together. And I can't uh, agree more there, Bruce. We all in this terrarium floating through space together, right? And the, uh, the atmosphere is about as... Uh, if you scaled it down, it's thinner than, I think, the skin on an apple. Is that about right? So uh, sure. it's, it's, it's our terrarium. We need to take care of it. All right, so what we're going to talk about tonight is the merits of uh, hard science fiction uh, in, in any kind of uh, media, books, uh, TV. And we're going to use The Expanse as the example because there's, there doesn't seem to be a show or any property I've ever seen do it better. And I think, Jack, you and I talked about this. I think we agree on this wholeheartedly, right? We do. Um, so, I'm so glad you picked the show I watched because I had no idea you were going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you didn't, you didn't have to. Mike hasn't seen it yet. Uh, all the, but uh, all I decided to be the what? resident ignoramus. I chose <laughs> to watch it. I was going to say that. Is your right custom role? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I have limited yeah. data, but that was I know my bailiwick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, nothing, and, and, and I. I can't say this clear, clear enough. I don't want anyone to take, uh, if you have a fandom that you like, like Star Wars or Star Trek or the Marvel movies, for example, I've got nothing against them. Love them too, but for different reasons. Uh, but I think there's, you know, there's not very much hard science fiction, which makes me think that uh, Hollywood doesn't seem to feel as though it has a place or has as much of a place as it should. I mean, The Expanse was two seasons on sci-fi. Fortunately, it got picked up on Amazon, so that's good. They, they, yeah, they did. Yeah, they announced it. Just announced it. Yeah, so three. Yeah, huh? three. Oh, sorry, you're right. Right, I screwed that up. Yeah, it's three seasons, and it's going to be the fourth one on, on Amazon. Right, right. Uh, so, anyway, so we're talking about hard science fiction, and I have a list of things, but I'm going to let my guests talk about this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let you guys take the show away a little bit first. Uh, what do you 
what do you find about the expanse that you really like that stands out that that is sci- good hard science that tells helps tell a compelling story well, you know i like that they get little details right i was just talking in fact to someone about this today it's the little things and they actually drive important plot points like here's an example Recently, I was watching some movie, the name I don't even remember. It was cute. But, you know, there was this boy on Mars who he was born on Mars, so he couldn't go back to Earth because, you know, you you have uh, certain biological problems if you're born in a low-gravity world that would make it hard for him to go back to Earth. So he's communicating with this girl via the futuristic equivalent of FaceTime, right? And it's instantaneous. He's on Mars, she's on Earth, and it's instantaneous. Yeah, that's it. That was it. Yeah, a cute movie, but scientifically, you know, it left a little bit to be desired. I like that on the Spence, they get that little stuff right. Like the fact that to send each other messages, there is a delay. So when you get the message, you listen to the whole thing. You can't respond interactively. And it actually drives a lot of interesting plot points because a delay in communication can, especially when, you know, there's world spanning or a, a solar system spanning war going on, it can really affect uh, what happens among the characters. And on the personal level, too, you know, you find out your wife filed for a disor- a divorce, there's, you can't respond, right? <laughs> it's just this thing that arrived. What's the delay? Isn't it about, well, it depends where you are. Yeah, it depends where you are in space. But yeah. That's the fastest it can go. Right? Right. That's yeah. if Mars is on this side with us, right? Because yeah. if it's on the other side. <laughs> that's right. Well, but there's also the, uh, the well, asteroid there's belt. There's a difference in orbital tilt that probably you could shoot over the sun. Yeah, but it's twice as far away as it was before. Well, oh, Earth. Yes. But, it's, but it's not limited to Mars. It's, there's also the asteroid belt. That's and, right. And, and so it, this, and all of that is consistent. All of it. It's uh, it's among the most fascinatingly well done science I've ever seen in any production anywhere. And they get it all right. And it doesn't matter if you understand it. There's no, you know, as they say in, in, the, in the book trade, there's no, as you know, Bob, you know, I was just going to use right? that. I mean, they don't spend, spend time saying, you know, because we're up here, uh, we're longer and thinner than the people that live on Earth. They just do it. And right. if you get it, you get it. If you don't, that's fine, because it's not even about that. The first season is a noir mystery uh, with a detective. And the rest of this stuff, get it or don't get it. They don't explain it, but it's all right. It's really good. Yeah, I, I was going to say... I, Okay, so I was going to say is that I think that um, one of the things that we perceive, whether we think about it or not, is the nuance of physics. Um, I know it from photography that, you know, you can tell when the shadows aren't right and things like that. Um, and, it, and it does take you out of the story. Um, I think it's maybe a spoiler to say that, uh, you know, they had this great demonstration of inertia in the, in the last episode. Oh, God, yeah. Seen it. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, that was Pretty amazing. <laughs> um, I was so because oh, this is another thing that's good about the show. They can make you like a character, like this character who was the demonstration. He was. I think that's the first time we've seen him, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we knew nothing about him. Richard. And in just a few short scenes, they built his whole personality, his background, his love life, his where he was coming from, his interactions with you know people. That, and he was by himself on a ship. It just a few minutes, but by the time I got to the end of the show, I liked this character, right? So it made me really mad. Yeah. <laughs> but they but they didn't waste him, right? They used him to show a pretty important. And, and I don't know, are any yeah. of you all reading the I'm novels? not saying what that important okay. thing are, are you guys reading the novels at all? No, I do want to, though. Okay, so so I've read every book in the series. It's literally my favorite series of, of all time, of, of any uh, speculative series. And it's going somewhere. That means something. What you saw is gonna is part of a much bigger like plot line that they're going with. So that that was really really cool. It's it's actually gonna be a plot drive another plot driving element to the story. And again, not gonna spoil it for anyone else to see because it just came out this week. But that was good. Well, you know the fact the idea that they would end the season yeah. was you know there's obviously so much unanswered. What is this proto molecule thing? Where did it come from? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Well, I, I think I know what that circle is. 
I, should I say it? <laughs> should you, I say you didn't read it, so you can say it, Terry. Sure. Uh, like a, a, a wormhole, black hole, a way to travel. Don't cook. Don't, don't maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't Confirming or don't confirm. I'll say maybe. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> well, like when my students say, I say, does anyone have any questions for this test? Yeah, would you give us the answers? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Right, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. But, but yeah, so they, they get that right. And, and I want to... Let's talk a little bit about the biology because I think Jack on the on the panel I watched you on uh, ask a scientist anything uh, that was mentioned about the the biology of what happens with people and how they get that right too. I mean yeah. that was they didn't have to do that kind of stuff. You know, it shows completely ignore a lot of a lot of properties completely ignore the fact that different environments that people are in, considering how much gravity you have or how much you don't have or or you know how much sunlight you get or don't get, uh, and, and they they address that very clearly. Right. It's um. It, it, first of all, it's a character-driven series. That's another thing. There is a larger set of issues, but it's very, very much character-driven, not, not sci-fi-driven. But everybody up to a point in this thing are all humans from Earth that have either oc occupied Mars some time ago or the asteroids or those some of the moons. And all of them have been there and had enough generations there that they are now affected by that. So the people who live in a weightless environment are very, very different to humans than the ones on Mars that are different from the ones on Earth. And all of that has got done right. And at one point, there's a scene where they're trying to torture somebody from the belt down on Earth to supply some information. All they do is make him stand up against a wall because uh, and, and he can't, he doesn't have the strength in his body to resist the, the – and again, you just see it. Right. They don't talk about it. They don't, they don't explain any of it, right? But it just is. And it's more effective, like the one about the woman who had never been on Earth. And when she first left the building where she was staying, just the brightness of the sun was very difficult for her to take. You know, it's those little details that, that they get right. There's another subtle detail that I noticed the other day. Uh, belters don't have the same idea of personal space that we do. Right. Belters get really close to each other to have conversations, which immediately makes me feel uncomfortable. But because of the way they, they're raised in their society, it's not weird to be that tight with each other. Now, it's strange. something they don't talk about on the show, but is in the books, is they have, um, Belters are used to being in space, and they're used to having spacesuits on. So they don't, they, they have developed their own kind of sign language. So when they answer questions, and they don't do this in the show so much, they do it in the book all the time, they talk about it. But a lot of times when they're talking and they say yes, they do this. They do a they do a hand signal because that's what they do in space and they're just used to doing that. So they, they have these shrugs, they have these, these gestures that they do that are indicative of somebody who spends most of their life in a space suit. Interestingly, they, they, did, uh, they did actually go for the sign language, yes. That's correct. That makes sense. So it's it's just it's it's uh it's interesting that, like you said, the level of detail that they that they do uh, and they think these things through. Well, the other thing is the language that they speak. You know, they yeah, they've developed different dialects of, in this case, English, right? Because we're watching it in English, and it's convincing. I believe it. I can understand what they're saying, even though I don't always know what the heck that word is. But you can, you know, it's it's well done because you can get the intention, even if the words are new and the words they introduce don't sound lame. <laughs> I mean, you know how if you make up a language, you can't. If you're not careful, it can sound sort of silly. It, it doesn't. It works. Yeah, I believe old, old people, when I'm talking like an old person, it's a pump, pampa. Yeah, because they kept calling Miller that. He said, yeah, pampa. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I have a question, and not watching it, but I've been reading up and uh, watching some science-y um, shows and um, YouTube videos about heat dissipation in space. Oh, yeah. Do they cover some things like that? Because I'm fascinated by... And hadn't really given it much thought that what can lose wars in space is just simply being in space too long without a way to dissipate your own body. Yeah, I, I don't think they've touched that in the show. I mean, I think it's there, but I don't think they, they've talked about it any. But, like, for example, you know, space is a space is a vacuum, so there's no medium for heat to radiate off. Right, right. So the only way for a, a ship or anything floating through space to give off heat is through, through radiation. And, so, and that is the most inefficient way to give off heat. So conduction or convection would be a much faster way, but there's nothing to conduct or convect into. So like when you see somebody go out of a spaceship without a suit on 
in any of the movies you've ever seen where they freeze instantly, whatever. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen at all. They actually suffocate. That's what happens. That's how, that's how you die in space. Um, but, or your lungs pop because you have your breath and your eyeballs shoot out. But, uh, <laughs> so it's, 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 not quite, not quite. But they, they do kind of like, yeah, the vessels start bursting as your, as, as your blood starts to boil. Um, basically every cell in your body has an internal pressure of 14.7 yes. psi. Yes. In space, you have an external pressure of zero. Zero, right, right. And, your cells start bursting so fast that you don't have time to suffocate. But but you no 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 that's not true. You don't blow up. No, actually, um, I, I I looked into this because that's what I thought too. I thought you either blow up or you freeze. But you don't do either one of those that's things. Um, it, it's because I forget how it, how it works or the why the temperature it is. keeps it from the. No, the temperature doesn't do. It, it's really weird. You have to look this. Go go read this. I, I can't explain it. I don't know it fully. Is Jack or anybody else on this panel smarter than me on that? Yes. No. But you know, <laughs> this. <laughs> But but at any rate, I, I I looked into that, and yeah, you you don't you suffocate. That's that's what happens to you. I mean, you eventually freeze, obviously. But like, uh, so there was a discussion about how heat is uh, heat is an issue. Like uh, on a lot of the the satellites, um, and I think on the space station, there's big long like panels that go out. I think they're solar panels. Mm -hmm. They're actually for heat dissipation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's no way for the sat for the the station to get rid of heat other than putting a whole bunch of surface area out and radiating it off. As best they can. But Why not convert that heat into some other form of energy? Uh, I don't you have to ask. Jack is so a rocket Jack, scientist. Yeah, so, <laughs> so let, me, let, me, let me answer it by changing the subject. Um, so in, in uh, the space station, uh, astronauts can die of the bends because the pressure inside the, the space station is a certain and it's roughly now 14 psi. It wasn't for Apollo, but for, or even shuttle, but it was for station. Um, and so that's why they have to decompress. That's why they have to go into those intermediate centers and, 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 and uh, breathe o pure oxygen. They have to sit and, and prep themselves so that when they step out in space, they don't suddenly have this bends is what they would really get. It's not so much an, ex an explosion as they would die of their own internal blood pressure. What is that time for? It, it's like two hours, I think it is, on station. It, what happens is the nitrogen starts to separate. Sure. And you form nitrogen bubbles, and that is real bad. Is that Wait, really like diving? Yeah. yeah. It's exactly, it's exactly like diving. Like diving. Same yeah, reason. Right. Same reason. Yeah. One of the things that indicates that some of them are so used to being out in space, I mean, all this discussion, I remember when I was a child and we were talking about going to space, I found it frightening. The idea, you know, the idea of getting detached from your space ship or your space station, and then you're just left to, you know, somersault off in space. This was like, uh, when I was a kid, this was how they scared you, right? Science fiction stories. But, you know, there's this one scene where they're so used to being in space and being in spacesuits. This father, to protect his son, shoots him out of the airlock when he's in a space shoot, and then he goes and does his thing and gets blown up. Or I forget exactly it's what, like he that. gets blown up. Season it's, one, it's like the first episode. Yeah, and the boy, he just leaves for his son's protection. He leaves him out in space in a spacesuit by himself. And he is eventually picked up by somebody. And, you know, that could only happen in a civilization where they're so used to being in space that that is less dangerous than taking the risk that his son would have gotten, you know, destroyed by their enemies on the spaceship. And it, they get the shift in paradigm. It's realistic and believable on that show. Just the also, the, liquor. you don't get it. <laughs> it's also the both the culture and the politics. So the Belters are are sort of like like they were an alien. They're sort of blue collar workers mostly. Yeah. Uh, the heroes of this first scenes and at least and and on were just moving water from you know from one place to another to supply it to people who needed it by breaking off ice. And they're they're blue collar and they very much like you'd expect almost a frontier. Uh, organization to be because they're scattered. Uh, but the politics there are all, everybody's against everybody. So the earthlings don't, the people of earth don't trust the Martians, which are still human. The humans don't trust earth. The builders don't trust anybody. Uh, right. And that conflict is very significant part of this whole, of this whole theme of what's going on. Almost like Game of Thrones in a sense that there's another real danger, but the people that are in the middle of it don't believe it. Mm -hmm. right. right, and it's it's interesting how all this this really hard science just 
drives this story. The story just comes out of this, but it doesn't talk about the science. It just it it imbibes it. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, the science permeates it, but it's it's not put in your face. It's, they're not talking about oh yeah, well, we invented this thing, and there's you know a whole bunch of talk about it. It just does it. But sometimes I wish they would. I mean, <laughs> I I like science. You know, I don't want the you know, well, Bob, you do know. Oh yes, and this. <laughs> right. But you know, you can you can work a little bit of exposition in well, there. I think they do. It, it's, there's much again. It's always right. The book is better than the show, and the show is is unbelievably good. But the books are even better, and they do go into the science of of some of this stuff. Uh, not a whole lot, but they do. I mean, they they talk about this stuff. Um, but you know. I think another another really big aspect uh, to to what makes this the, this show great or any any kind of science like this is that you know space is big and uh, I put in my notes like really really <laughs> big right how right, far yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right here right. um, so so like they address that uh, about how long it takes to get anywhere like when a ship leaves one place to go to another they talk in terms of months. Mm-hmm. Or or days, you know, to get like one like we're gonna go from this ship to this other ship, you know, and then they're they're talking about it, and you realize it's been several days that they've been traveling. Or the next scene is that one of the guys has a beard, and you're like, what? Because they've been traveling for months to get where they're going, and that's just the way the sh- and the show travels at those speeds. And I think it's awesome because I think it gets lost in a lot of sci-fi that you know space is humongous. Yes, there's. That, that uh, reminds me of uh, the show that got me interested in space and science fiction when I was that tall. It's Fireball XL5. <laughs> and okay. the first episode, there's this kamikaze rocket headed for Earth carrying a planetomic warhead. <laughs> XL5 intercepts and destroys it, and the computers in Space City calculate that it had to have come from Planet 46, and they say it'll take so many months to get there, so for a, a few minutes they have scenes of this or that character sleeping and doing other things, even in what was meant to be a kid's show. Right. Okay. But what they didn't realize is that Planet 46 was actually Planet 47, because oh, Planet 46 was destroyed! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm at Planet 42. Right. Sorry. That's the answer. That's right. So, uh, but yeah, and and they, um, like, like you were saying before about the communications, you know, there was, uh, in, just in this recent episode, there was a, a space battle going on, and the commander was like, well, you need to tell them to stop. I was like, well, they won't get the message for like a half an hour. <laughs> it might be all done by then. So, <laughs> so the, question, the question I have um, is, is a little bit more gen- general. Um, does the hard sci-fi in the expanse enhance or drive? Uh, clearly, it drives it. Um, but could they have told the story they wanted to tell without the hard sci-fi? Is this hard sci-fi necessary to the story? Yes. Yeah. It's and so then, so then, so essential. then, what do you feel the value of? It's completely interwoven in the story, so that I mean, for me as a scientist, I appreciate the, the effort to get it right. You know, so many of them don't. Right. But it's also, the science becomes not a character, but it's part of the world building. Right. So the politics and the relationships of the characters and the inner political interactions between these different entities is all driven by limitations and constraints of the actual science. So it's believable. It's not these contrived plots where, oh, this weapon we created that they won't fund, the government won't fund, could blow up the sun if you don't... <laughs> I mean, like Category A. Has anyone seen that movie? No. Oh, it's you. Blo- you can blow up the sun by asking the president for funding, because you know, you know, we always go to the president when we need funding, right? <laughs> and you have to give a demonstration, even though the, there's a possibility of blowing up the sun with your demonstration. You're still going to do it because you want the money from the president. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. The expanse doesn't do that kind yeah, of they're, stuff. They're, in fact, um, the, the 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 science, the science fiction part of this is so. It, there were several uh, panels, I guess, yesterday and today about world building, and one of the themes that came out of that is if you spend some time thinking through your world once you've got it, 
and say, well, really, what would happen? Really, what would it be like if they really were traveling space? Well, and what it does is flip open a whole new spectrum of things to do in that world that you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. That's clearly what they've done. Exactly. But there are also little things. Like you were talking about the site. Do they talk about the site? There's little things like – and this one particular thing is a hollowed out, uh, re- re-terraformed asteroid, and it's rotating. And it's sort of look inside; it looks like but downtown Bethesda or something, um, <laughs> really. But uh, but it's rotating. And there's this cop who's sitting up on his porch, and he's thinking about you know what he's going to do. And he's pouring himself a glass of something, and he pours it like this, and the light comes all the way over. Nothing. Corner. He just you know waits for it to come over because it's in that in that gravity well. At some point, a little bird is flying by, and it flies up to the porch, and it kind of Hovers trying to find it so it can set, set itself down. Those kind of details are, are breathtaking in this. And again, and it's like, oh yeah, that's life. It's really good. It also makes you willing to accept their what ifs more. You know, there, there's some very speculative science in this too. But because they've been so careful with, you know, creating this uh, communities and the world building and I guess the space building. In, in the series, you know, I'm willing to say, okay, I don't know exactly what I believe or not about the more speculative scientific elements, but I'll go with them. Yeah. You know, I'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm going to trust you because, you know, you're, you're doing such a good job of it. You know, I'm, I'm on the train. Let's go. In fact, the question asked earlier about, well, what about the radiative, radiative heat? You know, it's like, I'm sure they got it right. That's what I was thinking. Like, they got that right. I, I have no idea if it's correct. Well, well thinking, Jack, I'll tell you, they, they do. Uh, one of the things that they do with the show is instead of having lasers, there's no lasers. Nobody shoots lasers at each other. They do exist. They do exist in the world, and, and they are in the books, but they're rare, um, very rare, because, uh, and I don't know if this is where they were going, but it makes sense. Lasers generate a lot of heat. And like that's even internal to the to the mechanism itself, not even just the heat coming out of the end of it. So they use they use bullets in space. They shoot bullets at things and they shoot missiles at things. And lasers take a lot of energy to produce. Well, sure, sure yeah, they, they do, they do. But it, it's just that. Um, Plus, you can't make them as smart as you can make a projectile that you put in an intelligence or a homing system. Yeah. Laser is like jousting in space with yes. the lance. Right, right. <laughs> and they even they even. Uh, I mentioned things like, so if a space battle's going on over here, and then you're several million miles over here, and some of these bullets are still traveling through space, and they made mention of this, they're like, does it ever, does it ever bother you that, you know, a bullet fired around <laughs> Jupiter's uh, orbit might hit us here in Mars, because there's nothing to stop it from still, still flying this way, and you could just fly into one, and they're like, yeah, we don't think about that. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's Newton's first. Uh, which law is it? Second law: oh, an object in motion will stay in motion yep. unless acted by an exterior force. My students are all saying, but it doesn't really, right? Because on Earth, right, there's friction there. So, but that, oh, I should use that when I teach physics. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you st- have them start doing free body diagrams. Do a whole. Then they'll stop asking you. So <laughs> <laughs> their response is, "Do I have to?" <laughs> So, so actually, there, there are some other books that I've read that I think are really good at taking advantage of, of the physics. Um, David Weber's on Harrington books. Um, their space battles take into relativistic um, effects. They, they fight by leaving steel shot behind them. And, you know, you have a, um, a ship flying at 0.9 or something mm-hmm. like that, 0.7 of light. It's going to fly into steel shot. That stuff's going to... To turn into plasma and you sit down. And yeah, I used to do that when I write space battles. Yeah. And I would work out all of the math and, you know, all of that. How much energy does it have? I have these whole huge things and all the three-dimensional. And I got on a, a panel. It wasn't with David, but it was some, with someone who's known for hard SF. And he'd never met me yet. I think he just looked at me and said, oh, she doesn't write military SF. So he said, well, you can't call yourself a military science fiction writer. And I said, why not? And he said, if you really were, you'd work out all the equations and what happens. And so then I just started skewing all the stuff. Well, it's fascinating because if you're going close to relativistic speeds, you have start experiencing effects like relative to other ships. Is there dilation in your time? Is there... And you don't, there's not actually space contraction, okay? If you're in one dimension and something's going close to the speed of light, it looks as if the length changes. It isn't actually, it's, it's, you're receiving the light from one end of it 
at a different time than when you get light from the other end. So in a sense, it rotates. But it doesn't really rotate. It just looks as if it's getting shorter if you're just looking at one dimension. If you're trying to shoot another ship, that's a big deal. How fast is your uh, the things you shoot at it going? And if you come out going at close to speed of light and you shoot missiles which are going close to speed of light, you know how much kinetic energy those things have? I mean, it's, you know, a little tiny uh, object like a bullet could do immense devastation because close to speed of light, you have a huge amount of kinetic energy. And you can also, there's no, it's not like a dogfight, you know, where you're in a gravity well and it, like getting above. You, space is three-dimensional, so, you know, you may be fighting in this huge cone moving in space or a cylinder of ships. I mean, it's... It's a fascinating physics problem for someone like me who does this kind of thing all the time. It, 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 you're right. I mean, there are books and series of books to get it right. It's, the surprise here was that a television series did. Yeah, that was the big. Well, uh, well, then it makes you wonder. Makes you wonder why nobody or very few other shows even bother to make the effort. In fact, they they almost seem to purposely, you know, screw up do. the physics. I've been told one time. Just to give you an example, I was writing a story for a um, a franchise, and I used the word square root. I said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> oh, God. I said, seriously? Yeah, no, people don't want that. <laughs> okay. And the idea is that they're afraid they'll lose viewers. And I think they're wrong. I mean, people who like science fiction are self-selected to look. Yeah. Well, and if it supports the storytelling, yeah. right? If it, it shouldn't overwhelm it, it should support it. It shouldn't be the central factor, right? And then what difference does it make whether they they want accurate physics or don't want accurate physics? It's a tori- story well told, right? As long as it's I, I think Sci-Fi Channel got caught in that very thing. I don't think they expected it to be the overwhelming powerfully interesting thing that they were. They made a minimal investment in it. They didn't buy any other rights other than the ones of showing it on the day. Everything everything else, somebody else has. And it got so expensive and so popular that they couldn't afford it anymore. I mean, that's really what happened. They weren't, it, it was, it's still getting 100% on, on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. It's not that it didn't have, it had too much success, and they had not negotiated for any of those subsidiary rights. No, no uh, streaming, no aftermarket, nothing. They had this, and they just couldn't do it. And Amazon, Jeff Bezos says it happens, loves the show. And he was equally upset that it got canceled, so now Amazon has it. And it's like a rounding error on one of his yeah, bank right. accounts, right? Yeah. And so we had a question back. Did you want to? Yeah, Jack Campbell has a very interesting military series, and he makes very good use of time delay. Did you issue a order to your forces to disappear from the virtual staff room. And <laughs> so like, the hell happened? Well, the Forever War did that also. Right. Yeah. In the original Star Trek, there were occasionally times when uh, Lieutenant O'Hara would actually come out and say that uh, message from Starfleet Command uh, just came in from this message you sent days ago. Yeah. So, so I've, uh, what we didn't start the, the panel off with was kind of a definition of sci-fi, hard sci-fi, where the line is between sci-fi and fantasy. Um, you know, we didn't really establish that. We just kind of started talking about The Expanse, which is hard sci-fi. Right. And then, of course, you have the other end, which is, you know, Star Wars, which is fantasy. Well, actually, Star Wars, yeah, it's, you know, some, it's okay. I, I love Star Wars, too, oh, yeah. but for different reasons. But it's not like that. It's, for hard science fiction, I try to avoid too stringent of a 
definition, but I would say it's based in scientific facts that are known and we extrapolate from there by saying what if. Um, I actually, when I first started writing Hard SF uh, over 20 years ago, there was some controversy about whether my works could be called Hard SF. You know, they had equations in them and pictures of Klein bottles and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I had volumes of obvious mathematical uh, backing. But people felt that there was a, they didn't use the word feminine feel to it, but it didn't have the right feel. And when you'd start talking to them, you would realize there was a certain tone that they expected in hard SF. And for them, it was part of the literary quality of hard SF. And mine didn't have that tone. I don't think that's true anymore. I mean, you look at The Expanse. I'll tell you one reason I love it. The women are just as badass as the men, right? <laughs> or, you know, or as strong, or as uh, they're, when they're not, when they dip, uh, have diplomatic skills, that's valued as much. They're probably the most, the most badass characters in the show oh, yeah. are women. Yeah, yeah. Well, Amos is pretty bad. I like Amos. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> All right, and I love things from Baltimore. That's, <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> he was a mob boss. Yeah, yeah, he was a mob right. boss from Baltimore. Just All right, wrote, make it quick, though. Yeah, it's, a, yes, it's like it a pigeon. It's right. yeah, it's it a depends dialect. on where it is. Again, it depends on what the culture is. It's much more Creole in the belt. Yes. All right. I want to put a question to the panel as a non watcher and I want to ask each of you, or at least one of you, what do you feel like the Expanse got wrong? What is, is there anything that bugs you? Like, oh, I can't believe they didn't get this right. Or, yeah. or is it perfect? The rockets make noise when they're going through space. Yeah. And uh, they're like, uh, uh, do they not? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's good. It would have been boring without it. But right. they did. There's, you're outside the ship and you can hear it. Well, we as the audience, you know, that might, I, I, I'm going to be like I like that, by the way. No. <laughs> it's, it's an effect for us. No, I don't know. Sure. You're, you're right. Yeah, they, yeah. I hadn't noticed that before, but they do. When the ships blast off, you're outside the ship from the camera point of view, and you do hear the rockets going off. But maybe so, that's what they're hearing inside the ship. I rationalize so the same so thing. So there's, one, <laughs> so, so, so there's definitely one thing that's questionable for me. Uh, a major plot point was a video recording. And um, I don't currently trust video recordings. I don't see why I would trust them X number of years in the future. Yep. Um, you know, that, that bothered me a little bit that oh, they sure. kept showing around this video recording. I'm like, you know, why isn't it big? Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, think, about, think about this now. What we're doing here is rationalizing errors. Because we like the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love the show so much. Sure, sure, sure. They must have done that on purpose. Right. Why is showing a bank to get rid of this video camera? Yeah, but I'll, yeah, I'll tell you what, they, they just did a thing on NPR recently about this uh, this new uh, video editing and audio editing software that's out, oh, yeah. and it is scary, it's scary, yeah. because it's getting to the point, we're very close to seeing is not believing, like video may not be what you see. They actually had uh, the, the president's face saying something, well, this was Obama's face, the, the previous president's face, saying something that he didn't say. They just changed his, his audio and the video changed along with it. They did a remapping. I think they mapped it to someone else's yeah, face. You ma- yeah, you can face map and, and it's he, ridiculous. And he basically stuff. just said something that Obama would have never said and he said, the guy was like, the guy was watching, this is a radio, I was just on the radio, so the guy's like, that is really scary because that, are we going to be able to trust our eyes now? Are we going to be able to trust video now? Next, you're going to tell me Hulk's not real. Uh, <laughs> no, we wouldn't. No, no, Hulk's real. Hulk's real. Oh, okay. of course he is. I think, yeah, I think they could do more with the effects of what's it like to live in a weightless environment. I mean, they do take into account, for example, that you need rotation and how does that affect what we experience as gravity. But I think they could do a lot more with. You know, a lot of times, to probably to ground the viewer, that they're walking around on the spaceships as if there's just normal gravity. And they usually try to show at least something to, to justify that. But, and you know, you get so used to it, you don't notice it. But I think there would be a lot more situations where they had partial or no uh, sense, uh, a gravitational sense when they're in these spaceships out in space. So I'd like to see them do more with that. They do, they do enough of it. To, to just kind of say that we that they understand, right? Sometimes you'll hear the magnetic boots 
and then somebody will come on the ship and they'll go, hey, you got to, you know, you got to put these on. You know, but or they're the first season where they were having sex. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the engines kicked in and they had things. Right. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'd like to see them play with the effect because people um, are used to living in, you know, environments without right. gravity get used to doing it. But they again, again you room. know, I assume, I assume those things are expensive to make, right? <laughs> so, uh, again, you know, yeah. story, story has to come first and maybe there are that would be a great play on the story where weightlessness is a, you know, a huge mitigating factor in some. Well, maybe yeah. Amazon can afford. Yeah, maybe, maybe Amazon <laughs> can afford these it. Are, That's right. These are very expensive special effects. Yeah. So, it, it is a incredibly detailed. Sure. Incredibly detailed. Yeah, the only thing that bothers me, and that is because I get motion sick easy, is that I never see any of them get motion sick. And from what I've read from, uh, I forget, uh, what's the name of the guy who did the, the song in space? Did, uh, um, uh, Major Tom, was it, I believe? Oh. Chris Hatfield? Chris, yeah, Chris Hatfield. Well, I know who did the original. Yeah, no, the astronaut Chris Hatfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He even, I read his book, and he said that, you know, he would get sick. Everybody gets sick in space. Yeah. Like they, they all get sick at some point and throw up. You never really see that with anybody in the show. And I, I'm like, dude, I'd be sick the whole time. Yeah. I'm like, I, I would never not be sick. Didn't, you didn't. Know, so, no. But they're all experienced. No, no didn't, didn't, well, didn't so the, like, um. That one's inside his mind. Um, that that happened to virtually all the early astronauts on the Apollo on space shuttle. Uh, and they didn't admit it early on because if they did, they didn't get another flight. Uh, <laughs> that's true. There were several astronauts that they, they they thought they got sick and they never got another flight after that. So they all they, shut up. Where did they put it? I mean, just was <laughs> they, I don't know where they put it. They didn't even do, admit they did it. But but it but it does it does go away. I mean, some people don't ever get over it, but others, while they're there, it happens at first, and then they stabilize, and it goes away. Oh, so you do get, you can get used to it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so how do we treat that now? Do we, do we, you know, with like when they are on the bombing comet stuff like that? Are they learning how to perform yes. even while they're sick? Well, no, that, you can't just, perform what you're sick. Well, you know. <laughs> what you're doing is adapting. I mean, you can't lose your. You can't. I mean, you can lose your. <laughs> you lose your but you, but you lose your cookies, but you can't lose your your wits, yeah, right? So, there were I mean, there were situations on Apollo and shuttle where they were sick and had to do well on Apollo 13, where yeah. they were sick and had to perform, but it's not pleasant. Yeah. So it, it, usually it's a process of getting through it and just being patient with them and we'll get through that sequence. Yes. Yeah, it's very similar. It, you know, it's funny. I had in this book, Catch the Lightning, the characters toward the end of the first part, there's these kids from Caltech, and they go into space. And when the girl gets sick and throws up, she even passes out. And people are going, why did she throw up? I'm like, that's what happens when you go into space. It happens on, on it, uh, ships, for God's sake. Yeah. Right, you know, sailing ships. By way of analogy, uh, when I was in the Navy... I was on a carrier and accompanied by several smaller ships. We were coming back across the North Atlantic from the Mediterranean Sea, and we had a storm system traveling with us. We had waves breaking on the flight deck. So the captain gave the order that nobody, for any reason, was to go out onto a weather deck. The Small ships that were traveling with us would be completely submerged temporarily by the waves. We, when we pulled into port, some of the metal brackets containing the plastic life raft containers had been bashed off by the waves. I mean, the front end of the catwalk was bang. And if, I kid you not, everybody on the ship at one time or another at least once threw up, I would I made it through eighty-five percent of the way before I did. Right. So um yeah, and that's you know, that would be me. I would I would have been sick the whole time. I would have probably had my head in the toilet. Just I would have just strapped my head into the toilet and just been fine with that. But I, I get sick right in the passenger seat. So um but but to go, to go back to the show for a minute. So the, yeah. the, the person from the United Nations, the woman, yep. yeah, she got sick. For, for, absolutely. Oh, I was, I was going to mention this, that. This oh, is. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And and these are She's people who have now space. grown up, born in space. Many yeah. of them. They're not. They aren't like us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. 
Um, so I, one last thing I want to touch on that they that they do in the show that I think is, is awesome is it's in their, their social things. And we talked a little bit about this with like the, the you know the Belter Creole and and their hand gestures and stuff. But one of the things they, they touch on a lot and it's in the book. And I, I'm sorry I get confused between what happened in the book and the show sometimes just because um, you know I was like gosh did they do it in the show or not? But if you notice the Martian society is super efficient, right? And it's it, they're they're very um, they're very efficient in everything that they do. Like their whole demeanor, their whole society is you know it's very uh, very uh, condensed and very efficient. And the Belters have this way about them that they they check everything all the time. So if they have a free moment, they're checking some system on the ship. They're checking the CO two scrubbers. They're checking because it's life for them. That's if they don't do it, they're dead. And I guess they even mentioned somewhere that that is it's, it's almost an evolutionary it's almost like a social evolutionary process because the ones that didn't learn to do that aren't here anymore mm-hmm. oh, <laughs> so, we need that yeah. <laughs> um, did you have you all picked up on that have you noticed that mm-hmm. oh yeah oh yeah it, it's it's clear that some sort of weeding out has occurred right. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that's pretty much how the evolution would go. But it also drives some of the disdain that both the Martians and the Belters have for the Earthers, right? Because, yeah. you know, Mars is um, resource limited. They've had a really challenging time. Earth's been kind of dicks to them. Yeah. Then you have the Belters who are this, like, lower class, this, like, working class providing resources to Earth. And again, Earth's been kind of dicks to them. So, yeah, it's, it drives some of the story as well. And yet winter is coming. And <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Spot on. How are we doing on time? Uh, we got just a couple minutes. So why don't we do? Why don't we? Why don't we wrap this up? So final final thoughts. And if uh, we'll start, we'll, we'll go down. Start with Bruce, and we'll come up. Uh, final thoughts and give links and plug anything that you are doing. Okay. Um. So, not expanse related. Um. <laughs> so so hard sci fi is where I, I start. I mean, uh, Asimov, Highland, Clark. I mean that's. That's what I grew up on. And um, one of the things that I found uh, when we originally talked about the merits of hard sci-fi is it, it absolutely drove a, uh, a passion and a love for science and technology in my life. And um, I think that one of the things that hard sci-fi does is um, it provides um, uh, an envelope to tell a story in, um, whereas fantasy and sci-fi that isn't as grounded, um, it tends to, to bounce well out of the bounds. And, and I think for me, that I find that distracting from the story. And whereas where you have constraints, I think that forces you to tell better stories. Um, so yeah, so, uh, my link's uh, www.parsecawards.com. It's still in nominations. If you have a podcast that you want to nominate, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to do it. Um, and uh, www.brucefpressphotography.com. Uh, I do events and, and shots and cosplays and all this kind of stuff. Picture. And portraits and a lot of stuff, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm of the age that when I was reading science fiction and it was hard science fiction, it wasn't possible. <laughs> um, and so that was what I was a dreamer. I mean, that was my real interest in life was sci- as a kid was reading science fiction. And when I went to school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, in fact, thought about being a writer. Little did I know that that wasn't a paying uh, profession. <laughs> uh, and so, but then John F. Kennedy said we choose to go to the moon, and it was it was overwhelming to me that I could that this might happen that we could really do this. And I made my major in aerospace engineering, which was new at the time at the University of Florida. Mm-hmm. And I got my degree and my master's in high-speed aerodynamics so I could work on the space program. And in a period of 12 years, I went from this can't ever happen to supporting Apollo 11 and Apollo 13. It's just weird. Weird. And to plug something, um, going full circle, and although I have written science fiction, I have a book coming out at the end of the year called Safely to Earth, The Men and Women Who Brought the Astronauts Home. And it's based on my time. It's a memoir, but it really explores that level of invisible people that you never otherwise see. It's not the astronauts, although there are a few in them. And it's not mission control. It's that next level of people who really made all this stuff happen. That sounds like a good book. Thank you. 
I hope you say something when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least buy it first. Right. <laughs> as long as you buy it, we're all good. Right. Well, one of the things, as a hard science fiction writer, that one of the first things I realized was you're entering into a kind of pact with your audience. And this was something that we've all been talking about on this panel as consumers of things like The Expanse and how they satisfy that path. And what that is, is you agree to enter into a dialogue, especially as a writer, with readers who get the science and want to challenge you on it. And some of my most gratifying discussions with readers have been, one of the, the nicest things was I was reading the CIFWA bulletin, which is sent to all the CIFWA members of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. And I'm reading this article about how you show, you know, the effect of gravitational, uh, you know, on a space station, a rotating space station. And he was saying, well, you know, people who write elevators on space stations don't rarely do it right because there's Coriolis effects and there's all these various effects. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I've done that. And all of a sudden, there, in this person I'd never met, he said, and in Catherine Osero's Catch the Light, <laughs> she did it right. <laughs> And it was like, for me, one of the most gratifying moments when I was a new writer. I even wrote a letter to the guy saying, thank you for getting that. <laughs> and he talked about all the things I'd spent so much time getting right, he talked about. So then when things happened, somebody wrote to me and said, I've worked out, tried to work out all the orbits of all these moons you have around this planet. And I'm trying to set them, you know, figure out if they work and all this stuff. Do you have any details? Well, I did. I'd worked it all out based on Saturn. It wasn't exactly like, I think it was Saturn. I don't think it was Jupiter. I think it was Saturn. It wasn't exactly like the moons of Saturn, but that's what I based it on. And I gave him all this information, and I said, this is how they go, and this is their size, and this is their mass, and this is their orbit, and these are the ones that do funny things in the orbit, and this one passes the other one periodically. And he wrote me back, and he said, that's all really good, and I really like it, but the masses don't work. I said, what? <laughs> and then he said, unless it's the mass, you're doing it in units of the mass of our own moon. And I thought, my God, this guy is really smart because that's what I've done. <laughs> and so I wrote him back. I said, yeah, it's in the mass. Because it wouldn't have made sense otherwise, right? And so he went through and he worked out the whole thing. And he said, this all works. And he put it online. And he said, you know, this is Catherine Cicero's system of moons. And it was so incredibly gratifying for me, first of all, that he spent all that time doing it. Second of all, that I had the information. <laughs> so I didn't have to say, oh, I screwed up, right? <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes they catch you. Right? One time I changed the amount of antimatter that blew up. And this, uh, this, one of the things these people did so their enemies wouldn't get is they blew up all their space stations. I changed the amount. And I went through the book, and I changed it in every place, and I missed it in one. Sure enough, the book came out, and somebody wrote to me and said, you got this number wrong, and it should be this number. And, the, and, the, and you know, then you have to write back and say, oh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and it's now time. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we find you? Real quick, real quick. Oh, uh, my latest book is The Bronze Skies. It came out from Bain a few months ago, and I think it's in the dealer's room. Okay, you just enjoyed an, another awesome episode of the Myth Wits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guest questions or just banter with the other Myth Fits if you miss our live show. You can always catch the encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us at MythWits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube is Myth Wits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast for your, your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing here wherever it's appropriate, blah, 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 creative comments. <laughs> uh, just don't edit, don't sell it, and... Listen to it close to a black hole because everyone you know will be long dead by the time it's done. <laughs> Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And Mike? Eject the warp core. <laughs> <laughs>